All right, welcome back to another episode here of Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Today, we're going to be talking about central venous pressure basics. Uh, CVP is something that, if I could just take a quick 60 seconds of your time, I wanted to introduce our newest Whiteboard Medicine emergency and critical care community, and that is our Patreon community. Here we post emergency and critical care medicine medical education topics every other day. We focus on landmark trials, new trials, clinical pearls, bedside tips and tricks, and much more. Everything emergency and critical care. We also upload study guides for each video. We have practice tests. And our newest addition is going to be mini courses that kind of lay out video study guides, practice questions um, into an easily digestible form that we hope is very applicable and helpful to the bedside. Our goal is to try to get even 1% of our YouTube community to join our Patreon community. It would be incredibly helpful in allowing us to spend more time creating content and elevating our current content. We appreciate you all and we hope to see many of you there. I feel like it's ebbed and flowed into kind of prime time uh, over time. I think it's on a, uh, I don't know if ebb or flow is out, um, but it is not commonly used anymore. Um, I suppose in cardiogenic patients, it's used more commonly, but I, I think there's still a role here. And I think some people use it. And I think if you know how to use it uh, correctly and know kind of the strengths and limitations, it can still be quite helpful at the bedside. So we're going to dive into all things CVP today. We're going to talk about what CVP is. We'll talk about what normal is. We'll talk about how to measure it appropriately what it reflects, when it's useful, when it's not useful, some of the evidence behind it, complications, clinical pearls, and then we'll go into some practice questions. If you want access to the study guide, uh, we post all of our study guides on our Patreon page. We're really buffing up that community, so we'd love to see you there. It'll be linked in the description here. No further ado, what is CVP? So CVP, or central venous pressure, is the pressure within the thoracic vena cava near the right atria. So let's think about that for a second. It is the pressure in the vena cava near the right atrium. And what that means is it reflects the right atrial pressure. Okay? So if we draw, we're going to be drawing a heart, I think, a bunch of times this video. This is our heart. Right atrium, right ventricle. If you're listening to this, apologies, but you're honestly not missing out on much because we're terrible at drawing. Um, but if there's a central line with the tip sitting right by the right atrium in the superior vena cava, the pressure you transduce from this is going to be kind of a surrogate right atrial pressure, and that's the CVP. All right. And this pressure is kind of a surrogate for venous return, right ventricular function, you know, tricuspid valve function, fluid status. There's a lot of things that affect it. And it is a pressure measurement, but we sometimes use it to indirectly understand what their intravascular volume status might be. Because even though it's a pressure measurement, pressure, part of that equation is going to be the volume, right? The vena cava is a, a vein, it's a pipe. And how much volume is in the pipe might affect the pressure that that pipe is feeling. Um, but certainly, many other things are affected. Intrathoracic pressure, rate, atrial pressure, tricuspid valve lesions, rate of ventricular function, pulmonary hypertension, um, you, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but we use it as an indirect estimate of intravascular volume, um, preload, right ventricular performance, all that good stuff. So when we talk about a normal CVP, the textbooks often quote normal around two to six millimeters of mercury. And, you know, a value less than two may does highly suggest hypovolemia, but we don't often really stick that close to this two to six. You know, really a value less than six is quite low, um, whereas a value kind of greater than eight certainly greater than 10, is going to be considered high, and that could suggest volume overload. It could also suggest elevated intrathoracic pressure, or right ventricular dysfunction, or tricuspid regurgitation, um, which we'll get more into. But normal is kind of, you know, people say two to six, but in my brain, you know, I kind of think of it more like four to eight, uh, I think is a more realistic number. And just know when it comes to this measurement, the extremes are more useful, more dependable. So something, a CVP less than four, probably volume down. A CVP greater than, I don't even know if I'd say eight, a CVP greater than, you know, 14, probably volume up. Not always though, right? But probably. So the more extreme you get, you know, CVP a one, CVP a 20, those are probably most helpful. But anything in between, anything other than the extremes can be sometimes difficult to interpret.
So how do we measure it? And we got a couple CVP episodes out there already where we talk about this. Um, but what you want to do is you want a central venous catheter. And that central venous catheter, we're going to draw another heart here. Um, so again, if you're listening to it, apologies. But again, you're probably not missing out. Uh, we'll, we do always link the YouTube video in the description for the podcast. So heart again, right atrium, right ventricle left atrium, left ventricle, and you have your superior vena cava and your inferior vena cava, right? IVC, SVC. And the way you measure it is you have a central venous catheter that you place usually into the internal jugular vein or the subclavian vein, and it, you want it to sit kind of right at this cavoatrial junction, the junction between the SVC and the right atrium. And what you will do, whether you accessed the internal jugular vein, the subclavian vein, um, what you'll do is you'll transduce a pressure off this. Literally, you'll attach the catheter to a pressure sensor and record the pressure right here at the cavoatrial junction. What you might notice, though, is this needs to be in kind of the uh, upper SVC um, uh, outflow into the right atrium. So a femoral central line that sits somewhere in the IVC is not really helpful. It's not really well, well validated. Sometimes people check CVPs on there. I personally don't. Uh, not that this is uh, intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Always verify things before you use them clinically. Um, but I don't tend to do that. So subclavian vein works, internal jugular vein works, but the positioning is important too. So if your central line's too high, it's sitting way up here somewhere in the SVC, that's going to be less accurate. If your central line's super deep and it's sitting somewhere way down here, um, that might be less accurate too. You really want this cavoatrial junction location to transduce that pressure. Um, set up in zeroing. So you want to zero the transducer at the phlebostatic access. If you don't know what that is, that's going to be kind of the right proximate right atrial location. So oh, we're going to try to draw a human ling down. This isn't going to work. Here's a neck. Uh, here's a chest, here's a back, here's a head. Well, it's going to be a bad drawing. Here's an arm, goes to the waist. There's some legs here. And then their heart is sitting right here. Let's just say this is the heart. So where you want to zero this is going to be at the phlebostatic axis. You want to zero it kind of right in this region, right where the heart is. That's where you want the transducer to be. Uh, many uh, of my Awesome nurses will sometimes tape the transducer to the arm when someone's laying flat because the arm is going to kind of be sitting right in this plane. So they'll tape the transducer kind of right here onto the arm and zero it there. Other people have kind of fancy areas they put it on the bed and stuff, but you want it at this right atrial location, uh, mid axillary line, because you want to zero it right at the right atrium. You want the patient preferably to be supine or laying down at least, had a bed less than 30 degrees. And you want to read the CVP at the end of expiration to minimize respiratory variation when you're setting it up and zeroing it. All right, what does the CVP actually reflect? So you got a CVP, it was well set up, it was zeroed, all that good stuff. Well, as we talked about, the CVP can um, indicate a couple things. So a CVP that is incredibly low under the assumption that it's being done appropriately, but a CVP that's incredibly low, let's just say less than four millimeters of mercury, you know, that patient is probably volume down. They're probably hypovolemic. There's not a lot of stuff that's going to cause a super, super low CVP. Um, and it could be bleeding, right? Bleeding can cause hypovolemia too. But a CVP that's high, there's a lot of possible causes. One of those causes might be hypervolemia, their volume up. But another one of those causes might be right heart dysfunction. If your right heart is not working, you're going to have more pressure in the right side of the heart um, that is going to be transduced into the CVP. High CVPs might be that you have a really high PEEP. That intrathoracic pressure might be really high, and that can cause the PEEP to be high. Maybe you have tamponade. That can cause the PEEP to be high. So lots of things can cause a high PEEP. Less things can cause a super, super low PEEP. But remember, the extremes are more helpful than the in-betweens, the extreme measurements. When can CVP be the most useful? Well, there's a lot of different ways CVP has been used over time. Uh, septic shock, it was kind of popular uh, many years ago, um, but CVP trends in septic shock maybe can still be helpful, right? If you have someone who you've been transducing a CVP for days and their CVP has always been, I don't know, 10 to 12, and now all of a sudden it's dropped down to three and they're febrile, you know, that might be someone who now is infected and they need a little more fluid. 
Maybe it won't be though, but it probably is, right? So serial trends can sometimes be helpful. Um, CVPs and right heart failure uh, or cardiogenic shock um, can help you understand their preload or their filling pressures and also help you understand if they might need diuresis, right? And that trend over time is important. So really trends are much more useful than a single CVP number. Elevated CVP uh, can be a diagnostic clue in tamponade or pericardial disease. Um, cardiorenal syndrome, sometimes CVPs can help inform whether a patient might have venous congestion affecting the kidneys and would benefit from more diuresis. And then some people talk about CVP and its use in PEEP titrations. It's not something that we commonly do, um, but it is out there as a thing you can do. Um, so I think the most useful version of CVP is a uh, trend over time a number at one of the extremes of measurement, high being maybe volume overloaded now, low being maybe hypovolemic now, or in someone with a cardiogenic pathology, like cardiogenic shock or right heart failure, as a marker of the filling pressures to the right side of the heart to help you understand if they might have to be decongested and diuresed more. All right, when is CVP not reliable? Well, we've kind of talked about a lot of it. Um, it's got significant limitations, especially when used in isolation, especially as a single number. It in trials does not predict fluid responsiveness. And this gets into some of the nuance of what fluid responsiveness is. Fluid responsiveness is I give fluid and the stroke volume goes up. That's what fluid responsiveness means. And that's not what CVP shows, right? CVP tells you nothing about whether fluids are going to increase the stroke volume. It might indirectly imply that maybe it will, but you have no idea idea if it does or doesn't. Um, but CVP when it comes to fluid may tell you that the patient has low or high preload. And if it's super low preload, maybe you could make the jump that by giving fluid, their stroke volume would increase because you would have more filling pressure that then would translate to increased stroke volume. But again, right, we're doing like lots of this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. And if any one of those steps is wrong, it's all out the window, right? Um, okay. It's affected by multiple variables, as we talked about, intrathoracic pressure, PEEP, mechanical ventilation, tricuspid regurg, catheter position, right ventricular function, um, you know, is just a small list of the many things that can affect it. So lots of things can make it not reliable. And remember, you know, a CVP is 12 does not mean a patient is adequately resuscitated and a CVP of five does not mean a patient needs fluids. This is a pressure measurement, not a fluid measurement. It is a single data point. That's why there's intensivists, right? There's no perfect way to understand whether someone would benefit from fluid or not benefit from fluid or benefit from diuresis. There's no single measurement that helps us with that, which is why, um, you know, it's why there's intensivists in the, in the ICU, um, because these are complicated things. But CVP is a data point that can be useful at times, especially with trending it. All right, evidence behind CVP. Um, you know, Marek and Kav Kavalazi did a meta-analysis in 2013 of over 2,000 critically ill patients. Um, and this is kind of the big study that's quoted when people talk about CVP not being useful because they found no correlation between CVP and blood volume, cardiac preload, or fluid responsiveness. All right, and this was this 2013 trial. And from this, a lot of people would say, CVP, I don't even use it. But I still use it sometimes. <laughs> Uh, it shouldn't be used alone though, right? And it shouldn't be used alone, especially to guide fluid resuscitation. Critical care medicine in 2013 um, focused on like CVP reflecting a pressure gradient that can drive venous return, which is a much better, more accurate way to think about it. And a high CVP can sometimes impair venous return and lower cardiac output. Um, so understanding kind of RV preload and congestion, it can somewhat be helpful there. Complications of CVP monitoring, you know, this is more complications of central lines, but you know, you can get a central line associated bloodstream infection or eclapsy. That's a big no-no from a government monitoring standpoint. Uh, you can get thrombosis from that central line. If you're putting in a central lining, you can cause a pneumothorax. If the catheter tips too deep, it can irritate the myocardium, causing an arrhythmia. Um, and if you're not doing it right, uh, it can sometimes mid mislead treatment um, decisions. So uh, most of these Complications are secondary to the central venous catheter, or the central line, rather than the CVP measurement itself. Clinical pearls, um, to kind of get close to the end here, we'll have some practice questions after that. Um, clinical pearls here are use CVP to augment, not replace your clinical assessment. Use it as a marker, a single data point amongst the many data points to inform your decisions. A rising CVP, because you were trending it, great. 
uh, rising lactate, worsening oliguria, you might consider venous congestion or RV dysfunction, and you might consider diuresing those patients. Combine CVP with things like ultrasound, blood pressure, translactate, urine output, and organ perfusion, all that good stuff, and don't chase CVPs in every single patient. Um, that was kind of the old adage. You would have these CVP uh, goals and you would give fluid or diurese off uh, to try to meet a certain CVP number, um, but that's outdated, right? That may cause harm. That's not the right way to use CVP. There's no magic CVP number. Um, use it as a data point within the larger clinical context and trend it out over time. All right, let's get into practice questions. For those of you who have not uh, embarked on our practice questions before, what we will do is we'll read the question, we'll read the answer options, and then we'll go right into the right answer. So if you need more time to think about it, just make sure to pause the episode. Um, I think these ones are uh, shorter than our normal questions, um, but they hopefully will still kind of bring home some of the points. Question number one, what is the normal range of central venous pressure? A, 0 to 2, B, 2 to 6, C, 8 to 12, D, 12 to 20. All right, pause here if you need to. Correct answer is B, 2 to 6 is classically quoted, but our CVP normal that we think about is more like 4 to 8. But yes, 2 to 6 is classically quoted. All right, question number two, which of the following most accurately reflects what CVP measures? It measures A, the systemic vascular resistance, B, the left atrial pressure, C, the right atrial pressure and venous return, or D, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Pause here if you need to. Correct answer is C, the right atrial pressure and venous return. Remember, it's sitting right at that cavoatrial junction, and you are transducing a pressure from that area. So it's going to be the right atrial pressure that you're transducing, which can be a surrogate for venous return to the right side. All right, question number three. In which of the following conditions would you most likely find an elevated CVP? A, hypovolemic shock, B, septic shock, C, pulmonary embolism with RV strain, or D, diarrhea-induced dehydration. Which of these would cause an elevated CVP? Correct answer is C, pulmonary embolism with RV strain, right? Anything that is going to cause severe hypovolemia, diarrhea, hypovolemic shock, early septic shock, usually those cause a low CVP because the pressure is going to be lower because the patient is hypovolemic. Whereas things that cause RV, right ventricular dysfunction, like a PE with RV strain, is going to have a high CVP because that right heart is struggling and it's got pressure overload because it's pumping against a significant right ventricular afterload being the pulmonary embolism. That CVP is going to be high. All right, question number four. What is the most appropriate way to read CVP in a mechanically ventilated patient? A, at inspiration, B, at end expiration, C, during coughing, or D, in the sitting position? The correct answer is B, at end expiration. And this is really important because you can get incorrect numbers. So make sure you are doing this at end in expiration uh, so that the inspiratory effort is not throwing off uh, what the CVP actually is. And the last question, question number five, according to meta-analyses, what is a major limitation of using CVP to guide fluid resuscitation? A, it causes hypotension. B, it overestimates cardiac output. C, it poorly predicts volume responsiveness. Or D, it cannot be trended over time. The correct answer is C. Remember, it is actually a poor prediction of volume responsiveness. There is that trial on 2,000 critically ill patients, and it did not correlate with volume responsiveness in that trial. So in summer, use CVP trended over time. Um, if you're going to use CVP trended over time and use it as a single data point uh, amongst the many data points that you are gathering to help inform best guesses on clinical decisions. Cool. Let's know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Remember, this will be on our Patreon page, the study guide, if you want to check it out. Uh, we also have a YouTube platform, podcasting platform, all that good stuff. Um, we'd love to see you on some of those other platforms too. And nonetheless, either way, stay well, keep learning. We hope to see you next time.